The views and opinions expressed by guests on the TWBC podcast are solely those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views of nor constitute an endorsement by the host, TWBC, or the advertisers. National Championships, Confederation Championships, World Championships, major professional events. For over three decades, he has been there for many of the sport's greatest moments. And now he brings you even closer to the movers and shakers in the world of high echelon tournament water skiing. From the founder and creator of the Water Ski Broadcasting Company comes the TWBC Podcast. And now here's your host, Tony Lightfoot. Well, uh, greetings one and all, and this is the latest edition of the TWBC Podcast. I am the aforementioned Tony Lightfoot, and this has been recorded uh, prior to day five of the IWWF uh, World of Water Ski Championships from Sunset Lakes. And uh, one of the uh, the proprietors of uh, Sunset Lakes uh, is the the world-famous uh, water ski coach, uh, Jack Travers. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine. We're getting down to the to the very end of this um Wonderful, wonderful world championships. Excitement or relief at this point? Uh, a little bit of both, I think. Yeah. All right then. So, uh, tell it, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the process of actually getting these championships in in the first place. Because the uh, after the after some of the previous world championships were were, were hosting in sites that weren't particularly conducive, I'm guessing they changed their direction and they look towards uh, you to, to host these championships. Kind of give us a little bit of a backstory on that. Well, it was pretty much financially impossible for us to do it the way the system was in, in the past. But uh, Jose Antonio came up to me and uh, explained that he'd like to set up a situation where it would be uh, not so costly for us. Uh, they would actually rent the site and provide a lot of the uh, help running the tournament so it made it made it financially possible and uh, um, just uh, a situation where we felt like we could take take on the uh, job and obviously there are a number of considerations uh, finances aside i mean we're in, we're still in the midst of a worldwide pandemic so there are there were obviously a few few competitors and countries that weren't able to attend but the uh, but the wild card situation really opened up the competition and uh, and some some of the performances you know have, have really ratcheted up as a result yeah it's true um i think they increased the um in the independent uh, numbers up to 25 we were they were down around 10 or 12 i think in the past so we uh, it, it brought in a fair amount of uh, skiers we had over 200 skiers in this competition excellent stuff so uh let's go back a little bit into storied history a little bit i mean let, let's let's talk let's talk about you more uh, uh, moreover uh you've been involved in this sport well uh, for for what would appear to be donkey's years, I mean, all the, all the way back, I would say to about the nineteen sixties, early part of the seventies. Kind of give us a little bit of your backstory about your involvement in the sport and how we, how you and uh, Lalani and uh, the rest of your family got to this point. Well, um, I moved down from New Hampshire. I guess it was nineteen seventy one. Uh, applied for a job at, job at Jim McCormick Ski School. Uh, at the time, uh, I, all I really wanted to do was get involved in the sport. Uh, Jim really didn't feel like I had the qualifications to, to start coaching, and uh, rightfully so. I mean, I was a, a rookie skier, but uh, willing to work hard, and he gave me a rake and had me go to town with the the uh, gopher uh, jobs. And eventually I got a chance to ride, uh, to start driving in the boat and driving for, for Jim when he was coaching people like Wayne Grimditch, Paul Seaton, Ricky McCormick, uh, uh, some of the, some of the uh, actually we um, team members back then, Christy Freeman, Christy Lynn Weir, they were all in attendance at, at Jim's ski school. So I acquired a bit of, a bit of knowledge just driving the boat and listening to how Jim coached. Yes, indeed. And Jim uh, Jim McCormick uh, ran a ski school. You know, he, re- he retired some years ago. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. And he's a recent inductee into the International Water Ski Hall of Fame. I mean, just give us a little bit of a, of a sense of how much he, he impacted your life, you know, when he brought you on board, you know, because, I mean, the contributions he's made is pretty has been pretty much immeasurable. Yeah, um, Jim was a great coach. He was uh, quiet on the side, but when you when you got when you got him in the boat and you had him coaching people, it was uh, 
he was a wealth of knowledge, just uh, something you, you can't compare to anybody else at the time. All right, then. And you also mentioned a good friend of yours, uh, Paul Seaton, uh, who's... Uh, uh, who competed uh, for for Great Britain for a number of years, uh, had to retire after 1975 due to an an injury that, knee injury, which today would be relatively easy to fix. But back in those days in the 1970s, you know, that basically spelt the the end of your athletic career. I mean, you you struck it off uh, pretty well uh, when you got when you got involved with coaching him and what have you. And that friendship has really sustained all the way through to today hasn't it yes it has uh, it's been it's been a great ride with uh, paul uh, he actually came out and started coaching with me uh, after his retirement from uh, competitive skiing uh, we worked together several times he invited me over to, to uh, thor park to do a, a coaching clinic uh, with him uh, and we just stayed close we him and his wife margie and lenani and myself meet every year down at key west and uh reunite and uh, talk about talk about old times all the time you mentioned uh, Lalani uh, you're ba- basically your your partner in crime your right hand person you know that's involved in ru- in running running this site and keeping everything on a on an even keel uh, tell us a little bit about uh, a l- little bit about her and how you ha- and how you met up and then and, and then uh, formed this uh, fantastic partnership that is that has really helped you uh, through the good times and the bad times, you know, in here at Sunset Lakes, you know. Yeah. She was actually a school teacher in, in Groveland, and my first uh, when we first started up sun, uh, international tournament skiing, we were in a mobile home park just about two miles from here, as the crow flies, and she was it uh, was renting one of the mobile homes there, and we met up and. Um, just kind of hit it off and from <laughs> the rest is history but actually in truthfulness if it wasn't for her hard work and dedication this event never would have been, would have been possible of course and uh, i mean you you, you establish your your ski school on a, on a couple of lakes uh i mean i remember way way back in the day in like the uh, the late part of the uh, the 1980s you actually had uh, two lakes which were nowhere near as uh, sculpted and uh, perfectly formed as your uh, as your site is today uh tell it give us an idea of the challenges there because i mean I mean, you mean you had to fight off like reptiles and all that kind of stuff uh, just to make sure it was safe enough for people to go out there and ski, right? Yeah, there were a couple of lakes not very far from here. Just uh, we actually moved the, the facilities from that site over to here when we first started. There were um, two private lakes. Uh, one was pretty pretty good ski lake. The other one was uh, a little bit, uh, let's say, primitive. But uh, <laughs> but um, we we uh, we were able to. Um, trick on the one lake and slalom and jump on the other and we were also tri- tricking on lake harris so we had a, um, a routine where skiers would come out in the morning half of them would come to the to the slalom and jump lake and the other half would stay on lake harris and trick and then we'd rotate in the afternoon um, but it, it was uh it was hard work and um eventually the owner of those lakes i was able to purchase this property from and we started out with a peat mine we uh drug drug all the peat out of here a, a company called reliable peat was uh, paid me a royalty while we were pay- making the payments to the farmer and uh, we just kind of worked at it and, and it was a work in progress and uh, it took us about 10 years to develop these lakes actually oh nice and i mean you've developed it into a wonderful facility not only the original sunset lake which is uh, which has been the uh, the venue for the slalom and the jump events but lake sarah uh, behind us and lake grace a uh, little bit at, uh, over there uh the naming of those lakes uh, significant yes um, lake sarah was actually the name of this dried up lake bed uh where it is today um Sunset was obviously if you if you're out here about seven o'clock at night you'll see a beautiful sunset. There was a gorgeous one last night, and Lake Grace is, was named after after my mother. All right then, so uh, we're we're coming up to the end of the uh, of of the world of the world championships. Uh, I mean you I mean you've all I mean you've organized the the, the tournament. You and Nalani, you're bringing in all these people across across the world. And I mean, I mean you. I mean you're on you're on site. You're doing this. You're doing that. You know. You you you. I mean, I mean how 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 do you set time 
time for yourself to actually look up and see what's going on in the water and uh, and and track like skiers like your own son a jt you know yeah. it's not easy um, you just have to pay attention to what's going on and see the people that you want to see um you know we've had a tremendous amount of help from our, our homeowners and my, my sons chris and john have been an, an extremely uh, important part of this event dedicated themselves for the last uh, two months to get this site ready and I, I hope everybody's been pleased with what they've seen oh yeah absolutely i mean i mean the feedback that i've gotten from a whole bunch of people has been absolutely absolutely top notch and uh and I mean, we're we're coming up coming up to the uh, to the end of the of, of the of the World Championships, you know, and and, and I mean, you, we, we've had some great performances, and there's still some, and I mean, the story is yet to be fully fully written, uh, and 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 I mean, there's so so much te- technology involved in the sport. Let's go back a little bit in time, you know, uh, from in your era, which is the the, the 1970s when you started, because I mean, people at that time. The jump skis were about sixty-six inches long. I mean, ha- I mean, what what were your coaching techniques like back in those days to uh, to be able to get distances from jumpers with those relatively short jump skis? Well, it was it was difficult. They were actually when when I started coaching, <coughs> excuse me, at uh, at Jim McCormick's, they were only uh, wooden jump skis, and actually Wayne Grimditch was sent a pair of composite structure skis from Roger Teeter. And everybody kind of laughed at them when, uh, you know, because they were light and and fast and uh, a little bit difficult to control when you're used to heavier uh, pieces of wood under your feet. But um, that's where it all started. Um, give credit to Roger and uh, Dave Saucier to come up with the the technology to build uh, fiberglass skis. And how much is your site now involved in the research and development in a lot of the future technologies that we that we see today? Well, we get a lot of calls from manufacturers. Uh, Perfect Pass came down here for about two months when uh, speed control first came into play and spent a lot of time developing. Uh, we have HO here all the time doing clinics and, and uh, testing skis. And we've, we've worked in the past with uh, Denny Kidder and um, uh, Pat Conley. It's just been, uh, it's, it's been great to be involved in it. And, uh, it's been an honor to be uh, associated with those people. Now, obviously, we look towards jumping because, I mean, uh, uh, m- probably probably the vast majority of the world's top uh, jumping athletes have come and have trained at this facility. Uh, let, let's talk about look. Let's talk about slalom a little bit because, I mean, we I mean obviously JT is here all the time, and then you've got the likes of newly crowned world champion Jamie Ball, and then you've got medalist uh, Will Asher as well. So. Uh, so how how has uh, how has R and D worked out on on this this particular facility over the years? Well, a couple of times a year, um, HO will come out with uh, several of their skiers, and we'll do some testing and training. Um, they'll cut up and drill and grind on skis and uh, try to figure out what the best product is. And every year, that's something new, but it's something better. And tricks as well, because I mean, way 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 back in the day, some of the world's finest trick skiers uh, plowed their trade here and uh, got up to high echelon levels. Uh, tell us a little bit about trick skiing and and uh, the impact upon that discipline from the activities here. Well, uh, I think a lot of the increase in the, in the uh, in the performance in the trick skis has really come from uh, the skiers themselves, the youth out there. It's just incredible how much uh, they've sh- uh, shown. In this particular tournament, uh, you know, we have some record holders out there that are uh, being pressed pretty hard by some young skiers. So I don't see a whole lot of difference in the in the design of the trick skis. I just see a big difference in the in the uh, techniques that skiers are coming up with to uh, to push the limits on you know the, the flips that are being done and the toe tricks. It's it's dedication from an early age. All right, so you've been involved in the water ski uh, water ski school game for nearly fifty years now. I mean, uh, do you, do you ha- do you have any interesting sh- uh, stories to to share in amongst in amongst those times since the nineteen seventies? Uh, I see you have a little bit of a grin on your face. Well, there's been some interesting stories. Um, one in particular, we teach people when they learn to jump to go over the side of the jump, uh, over the corner rather than over the top. And um, actually, Paul Seaton and I were in the boat and we. We're teaching a youngster how to do this this particular method, 
And at, after he went over the ramp, ramp the first time going over the corner, we turned around and we went back by the ramp. And it looked like he was trying to spray the side of the jump. We didn't think much of it. We took him back over. He went over the corner, went over a little higher. Turned around and we came back. And he actually went over the side curtain the opposite direction, <laughs> thinking he was supposed to go both ways on the jump. There are lots of interesting stories like that. I mean, you get skiers from all over the world. I mean, uh, some some of the students that come into a ski school such as this, I mean, the international reputation that it has, you know, uh, that sometimes there's a bit of a language barrier, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Um, in particularly with the, the Orientals, um, they're a really classy group of people. We had a lot of them during the spring, uh, spring breaks from college in, in Japan. Um, and it, it's funny because... They, they'll, you'll see that they always travel in pairs so that one of them can at least communicate. Um, but the, the odd thing is sometimes that person isn't in the boat when, you, when you're coaching and, and you'll coach the Japanese and they'll always, when, you know, you say, do you understand? And they always say, yes, yes, <laughs> I understand. But they do the same thing all over again. So. And you've also entertained skiers uh, from uh, places such as uh, Russia and Ukraine, and in particular uh, Belarus, uh, where your uh, where your daughter-in-law uh, come, comes from, uh, Natalia Berdnikova. You know, so uh, give give it give us a little give try and give us a little bit of a sense of how important she's into the mix here at uh, at ITS. Well, she's uh, heavily involved in coaching now. She she really enjoys coaching, particularly the uh, jump and the trick event. And she'll, uh, we have to kind of get after her from time to time because she likes to keep the student out there longer than we can afford to do that. But um, it's all about them getting the right instruction and, and doing it often enough to where they really come down and, uh, and, and learn the tricks that she's, she's trying to get, get them to, to uh, follow up on. All right, then. We're going to round off uh, the uh, the podcast right here. Thanks a lot, uh, Jack. Now, I normally invite people uh, before I round off the uh, podcast to say a big, uh, give a big shout out and thanks and what have you. So I'm going to give the mic over to you uh, in order for you to do that. And uh, so, so well, there you go. Okay. Well, I can't say enough about um, all the dedication and hard work and uh, organization my wife has done to, to put these championships on and, you know, my, like I said before, my two boys, Chris and John, have just worked their their tails off to make this this event happen. The last two months have been uh, just um, a dedication on their part, and uh, I can't thank them enough. And our homeowners were, were really helpful. Excellent stuff. Uh, you've been listening to Jack Travers. My name is Tony Lightfoot. This is the latest edition of the TWBC podcast. And until next time, it is ciao for now. Thank you for listening to the TWBC podcast. Be sure to check out our website at waterskibroadcasting.com. Links to our presence on major social media platforms can be found there, as well as updates to our webcast and this podcast. Duplication or rebroadcasting of this broadcast without written consent of TWBC is prohibited. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to join us next time for the next edition of the TWBC podcast.